I will be sharing today uh, comes from uh, a portion of um, the studies from my upcoming book in 2019, Chinese Literacy Learning uh, in an Immersion Program, um, to be published by Paul Gray Macmillan. And um, so, let's get started. Today, uh, I will talk about first, um, to, for those of you who are not familiar with dual language immersion, I will briefly uh, talk about the growth of dual language in the United States. And secondly, I will briefly introduce or talk about my research in a Chinese Mandarin, which is the standard language, spoken language, uh, Chinese and English dual language program. And thirdly, I will discuss the implications for research and practice. So, first of all, what is dual language immersion? Um, so, it can be, um, dual language immersion can be said to include programs that basically teach subject matters such as math and science or social studies in two languages uh, with at least no less than 50% of the time. So um, the population is this kind of program serves can vary. Um, the so-called foreign language immersion typically teaches um, a foreign language plus the societal language, in our case English, to the majority language speaking students such as, you know, uh, at John Stanford or McDonald, they offer um, Japanese English immersion and Spanish uh, English immersion. I see a student there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, typically those students speak English at home and do not have uh, competence in another language other than English upon entering the school. However, another kind of uh, immersion is the so-called two-way immersion, which combines both uh, minority language speaking and majority language speaking students. And therefore, the communication is not just one way from teacher to student, but also between students themselves. However, it is really hard to separate, uh, you know, who lives where, right? And for school to enroll just one type of students. So um, I, I believe the education field is gradually moving away from such clear definition of one way versus two way, but uses dual language immersion as an umbrella term. And I had substantial discussion with Michelle Aoki here, I should recognize that she is the international program administrator for the Seattle Public Schools. And all these wonderful international programs we have uh, in the city, it's because of her effort. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then why dual language immersion, right? This is the obvious question, but sometimes not so obvious. First of all, um, a, a very recent 2017 study from the RAND Corporation shows that um, after lottery, uh, so students were, uh, the same student uh, from the Portland Public Schools actually were assigned randomly into immersion or traditional English programs. And the study followed them for many years and tested their achievements in reading and math in English. And it was found that, especially for reading, I believe I remember that by, by grade five, those who were randomly assigned into an immersion program, including Russian, Japanese, Chinese, and Spanish, performed significant, significantly better than those who were assigned randomly to a traditional English program. And there wasn't significant difference in terms of their math, but at least they're equal. Um, and by reading, the English reading, those who were in the immersion program were at least eight months ahead of those who were placed in a traditional English program in reading English. So the interesting thing is, even those who read, who were taught less in English, did better. Um, secondly, uh, also the dual language immersion programs become popular also is because our population in this country is shifting. According to uh, statistics by the Migration Policy Institute, um, do, the dual language learner population, meaning students who come from a home where a non-English language spoken has grown by 24% since the year 2000. And uh, another statistics show that one in five um, primary and secondary school uh, students in US public schools are the so-called emergent bilingual speakers who uh, speak a non-English language at home. However, up until now, I'm talking about a different bo body of students, right? Um, however, my study is about another type of students 
who are major, uh, who are English speaking at home, who also desire to be uh, bilingual and biliterate. And unfortunately, in this country, we do not really emphasize um, this majority language speaking population to become bilingual and biliterate. So this kind of discourse is rather negative and deficit in a way, deficit oriented. Okay, so I really want to uh, <laughs> see that we are talking about bilingual and bicultural for every child who desires to be so. Um, for immersion uh, programs for majority language speaking children, uh, the language immersion is the most effective method of foreign language instruction. And also, with the celebrated idea of bilingualism, bi biliteracy, and biculturalism, um, there, we have seen an increasing desire from majority language speaking parents who also want their children to become you know, culturally aware, bilingually uh, proficient, and also globally competent, okay? So, um, dual language immersion in the US has witnessed a dramatic growth over the past years. And I have compiled my data from several different sources. But unfortunately, after talking to various colleagues from, uh, such as those in the bilingual research group in the uh, American Education Research Association, for example, uh, even though, for example, Spanish program has uh, um, increased dramatically in the past uh, 20 years, there has been, there, there is no um, top-down database for all Spanish dual language immersion programs across the country, even though we desperately need such a directory, right? Um, I based on existing data from the Center, the Center for Applied Linguistics, as well as the Mandarin Parent uh, Immersion uh, Council for Mandarin Parent Immersion. Uh, I, now I don't recall the full name. Uh, I compiled some data based on um, from 2007 to 2018. Uh, we can see the two most, the two programs that grow fastest in the nation is Spanish, are Spanish and Mandarin. Okay. However, I have to point out this data is really misrepresented because Center for Applied Linguistics did not update its uh, directories uh, frequently enough to reflect the change. Okay. Uh, however, the Mandarin data is rather uh, complete. This is actually compiled by a UW alumni. Uh, whose name is Elizabeth Wees, and she diligently collected and updated all the data. And her most recent update was in 2018, August. So let's focus on the Mandarin program um, profile here. You can see in 2007, there are only 15 programs nationwide, but by the summer, uh, it was reported that there are 246 programs nationwide. Um, and according to duallanguageschools.org, there are uh, uh, about 1,500 uh, dual language programs of all languages altogether. So you can see this dramatic um, expansion. Now, um, based on the database that Elizabeth provided me, I analyzed the characteristics of all the uh, dual language immersion programs involving Mandarin. Okay, um, from this chart, I can we can see that. Um, over 52%, 52% of such programs are elementary school only, K-5. And then another 25 of them are from elementary school to middle school. And of course, because Mandarin immersion is, is still a relatively new idea, and schools are still building up its program one grade per year, let's say. Uh, and also in terms of instructional model, let me talk about instructional model a little bit. Uh, for Mandarin program, 84% of such programs are one-way programs, which means uh, children upon entering school do not speak Mandarin. And such programs typically adopt a 50-50% model, which is 50% English, 50% Mandarin. However, there are also a, uh, about 19% of those programs that all start with 90% in Mandarin, 10% in English, and then they add the, content, the, add the percentage of English gradually. By grade five, they reach about 50-50. So, but we can see the, the trend here for Mandarin programs. Um, so here's the thing. Having examined the current situation of Mandarin immersion in the United States, the question is, how do English-speaking children develop biliteracy 
in two languages, which employ you know uh, the highest uh, orthographies of the highest contrast. That's the question. So I started from here. Um, but before I propose my research questions, I would like to define what reading, what reading is. Um, so according to the universal grammar of reading, which has nothing to do with Chomsky, <laughs> um, reading is um, reading is jointly defined by the spoken language and the writing system. Um, the first preposition asserts that re uh, reading, uh, right here, reading actually encodes spoken language. So spoken language matters a lot in learning to read. But uh, here, by the involvement of language, we don't just mean that it, it is about phonemes and all that. It is also about grammar and phonology and pragmatics, how they are included in the language and how they are encoded in the writing system. And secondly, is about the writing system, how writing system actually maps uh, or, or represents the language, let's say. Uh, and this is what complicates the matter. So across all languages, according to Profetti, almost all languages, there, it, there is no exception where a, a, a writing system does not represent an oral language. Uh, and secondly, what complicates the matter is how an individual writing system represents this particular language. So here, um, let me show you an example. So um, we know reading uh, from at the at the lowest level, you know, learning to read is about decoding a word. Um, upon seeing a, a simple word like this, cat, of course, as fluent readers, we can imme immediately recognize the word without any effort, right? But for a emergent learner reader, this is not an easy process. So the first step for them is really to recognize that the three letters uh, in this word are actually. Represent, can represent three different phonemes, and these phonemes, when blended together, can actually represent a, a word that they already know, which is this. So this simple process um, is what a beginning reader have to get practice on all the time. And a, sim a similar process is this, um, encountered by readers of other languages, such as Chinese and Japanese. But the difference is that this, this symbol here um, represent a syllable um, in, Jap uh, in Chinese and then in Japanese and also represent the same idea here. Uh, competent readers do not need to apply their knowledge of the mapping system consciously to recognize the word they encounter. But if they do encounter a word that they have never seen before, they need to apply such stra strategy again. For example, uh, my seven-year-old just encountered this word in a book that he's reading, so he, he kept repeating this word. And he was using uh, his letter sound correspondence, the knowledge of such, to figure out this word. And the proficient Mandarin uh, or Chinese readers also use their knowledge of such um, sound to uh, symbol to sound correspondence to figure out uncommon characters. So, this aspect is very similar across languages. Like just now I said, reading is not just about uh, decoding. Um, and reading is, one of the ultimate goals of reading is really to comprehend the text that we encounter. So in this process, decoding serves as one of the basic skills and language comprehension also plays a very important role. Um, for decoding, for children to get the idea of reading, they really need to develop the idea, concept of print, meaning how to read a book from left to, read, uh, to right or from to right to left, to bottom to top to bottom or bottom to top, right? Some, something like that. And also, can you go back to read? And which letter does this, which picture does this uh, sound represent, for example? All of these are included under the term concepts of print. And additionally, a very important uh, concept, which is phonological awareness, uh, also play a, a plays a very important role in the development of decoding. Phonological awareness basically refers to, um, simply put, your ability to um, identify, uh, recognize, identify, and ma manipulate phonological units in a sound. Um, and uh, I will talk about this uh, later and, and discuss how it is related in reading to, uh, learning to read English and Chinese, and they play uh, quite different roles. And language comprehension. 
what our knowledge about uh, our language knowledge contributes to language comprehension and our background knowledge also matters. Um, so all of this are um, under this whole uh, umbrella of reading comprehension uh, as you know the learner internal um, variables like, like I would like to call them, but learner external variables such as <laughs> how much language input you're getting in a particular language as well as how much print input you're getting in a particular language also shape your development of language and literacy skills. This is true for all languages and true for all cases of reading, whether it's monolingual or bilingual. Um, having discussed this, I would like to uh, transition to a quick discussion about the differences between monolingual and uh, bilingual reading. There are a lot of similarities, actually, between these two modes of uh, reading development, but of course, a lot of differences. Uh, to begin with, the similarity. We believe that they follow a similar developmental sequence and a common set of cognitive and linguistic requirements also shape um, the development. Phonological awareness and morphological awareness are believed to be uh, the foundational competences, metalinguistic competences that serve uh, 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 the process of learning to read. And like I said earlier, both modes of learning to read need substantial input, including uh, oral input and print input. The differences are that first, um, monolingual uh, bilingual readers receive a different amount of oral and print input or exposure in these two languages they're learning. And secondly, um, bilingual learners presumably have different amounts of linguistic knowledge in the two languages uh, they have they, they are learning and also um, depending on you know what type of bi uh, bilingual learner you are sequential or simultaneous okay especially for sequential uh, bilingual learners you always have a set of previously acquired competences uh, your first language um, you know linguistic uh, linguistic <coughs> knowledge and your phonological skills and all that play a role in your later second language learning um, so Let's now turn to uh, research on bite literacy learning in immersion programs. So far, uh, based on my research um, uh, literature review, the vast majority of literature about immersion education is on English, Spanish, and English, French learners. Um, and a, a, a very important term that educators and researchers pay attention to is the so-called cross-linguistic transfer. Um, simply put, transfer basically suggests you know your previously acquired skills or knowledge in one language can be used in the process of learning a second. Okay. However, I argue that uh, this implies a very rigid understanding of what actually happens in the learning process. Uh, the first is that typically it is too often assumed that any language skill attained in an L1, especially first language, especially the first language resembles your second language, such as Spanish and English, you just automatically transfer whatever you have, which is not always true. And secondly, for when children or adults are learning two uh, very different languages, such as Chinese and English, I have a reviewer comment, how is that possible that one trans transfer skills between two uh, very different languages, okay? So uh, there, there are very different ideas. And secondly, um, it is um, L1 skills is assumed to be conveyed upon seeing such a term. However, it is often the case that it may take a few years for one's first language skills to become usable in a second language, in learning a second language, okay? Um, therefore, I would like to invite you to think about this whole, the whole thing from a different perspective, which is, you know, resource sharing. Uh, we learned a first language and we're learning a second language. What we have is there, but it may or may not be immediately useful. It will show up as useful at some point. And this some, at some point is subject to a lot of different factors. So let's take a look at uh, what are the things that are shared, shareable, and unique. Um, so the foundational skills are uh, including concept, concepts of print and many cognitive skills 
uh, serve as the foundational skills for language learning. And metalinguistic awareness and background knowledge, such as phonological awareness, morphological awareness, knowledge of the world, cultural familiarity, um, goes under that title. And thirdly, linguistic knowledge, including your knowledge about the writing system, your vocabulary knowledge in a particular language, uh, your knowledge about the word structure or sentence structure in a particular language, serve as your linguistic knowledge. And lastly, one's skills, reading skills, such as decoding skills, uh, reading comprehension skills, for example, go under there. Uh, for decoding skills, your, your skills um, in terms of uh, doing the symbol to sound mapping, symbol to um, meaning mappings, and also your inference skills um, all go under there. So, so for all these, foundational skills and metalinguistic and by background knowledge can be shared, okay? And then linguistic knowledge is unique to each language. And then decoding skills and other reading skills are shareable. It, it can be shared, but it may or may not, okay? Because all of these, um, such as age, language differences, oral language measures, uh, writing system, instructional language, and home language, and socioeconomic status, and so on and so forth, actually affect which and what um, reading skills are shared, okay, or are, becomes serviceable. So now let's turn to my research on English and Chinese um, immersion. Oh, in English and Chinese bilingual learners, the majority of the research to date, I found, it focuses on Chinese immigrant children. And this group of children actually is a large number. Uh, they, according to uh, Scott McGuinness um, uh, estimate, 75% of the entire Chinese learner population are this type, the, those who were born uh, to a Chinese speaking family, learning to read Chinese in a weekend school. And then um, they go, they attend a regular public English only public school. Okay, um, so I argue that there are actually fundamental differences between the Chinese emerge uh, Chinese heritage language learners, as I as the research literature usually call them, and the Chinese immersion learners that I am referring to, and such characteristics of learners should be. Uh, paid attention to because research findings may or may not be generalizable from one particular population to another. And uh, the, general, the general differences between these two groups can be looked at from both uh, learner internal and learner external uh, aspects. Uh, for example, uh, whether oral language competence in English is readily available upon entering school whether oral language in Chinese is available upon entering school. Uh, home language and print input in English, uh, is that sufficient and available, right? Home language and the print input in Chinese, are they available and sufficient? And whether there is sustained classroom input in Chinese. Well, English is the instructional language in all schools, but whether Chinese, you know, the minority language is available and sustained in a classroom situation, that, that's a different matter, right? And also, teacher. We know uh, instructional language and instructional quality make a big difference. So, in all these aspects, uh, I found that these two groups actually are just the opposite. So yes and no here does not, it's not dichotomous. I just want to put it there to indicate a degree and to show that they are actually quite on the, on, on the two opposing um, uh, direction, okay? Um, therefore, there is a need for us to know more about the majority language speakers in a Chinese immersion program. That's where I started in 2012. Uh, so my questions are simply, can oral vocabulary knowledge, phonological awareness, and word level reading skills measured at time one, which is at the beginning of second grade, um, predict later reading comprehension scores measured at time two, which is uh, one academic year later, um, at the end of second grade, within each language. So from Chinese to Chinese, English to English. And secondly, can these kind of skills predict reading comprehension scores across languages? So I started with these two simple questions, and why grade two? It's a little bit random because um, 
most um, immersion programs, you know, children enter the school without prior knowledge in Chinese. I want to give them an opportunity to develop some initial literacy skills before I measure them. Otherwise, I, I don't have much to deal with. <laughs> um, that's that's a, a realistic concern. So on the research side, I collected the data um, in a West Coast city in a large public school. Uh, in the area, there's no major Chinese-speaking population in the att attendance area, okay? And uh, this is an interesting uh, graph I'm going to show you about the school. This is the enrollment history from 1996 to 2016 to 2017 school year. Um, the most interesting part is here. You, you see this is the lowest. It's 257 students enrolled at the school. This is way below the school district's uh, standard for school close, uh, uh, keep a school open. So the school district was going to close the school down. Um, but then the district decided to give the school one additional year with a new principal and let's see if we can do anything better. So the, dis um, the principal actually came up with various strategies and worked with many parents in the area and dual language immersion in Chinese uh, was the idea that they implemented. And over the years, as you can see, this school has become one of the uh, most highly sought after schools in that city. This is a different matter about uh, educational opportunities, which I will not touch upon at this point. But as you can see, um, at least you know the school um, has done a tremendous job in um, you know maintaining and growing this language program. So I recruited um, 37 participants from the second grade cohort, and uh, six in total of them have either both Mandarin speaking parents or um, Spanish speaking parents or at least one Mandarin speaking parents and I did an informal comparison between this, the test scores between this group and the, major, the, uh, the other group and there's no significant difference. So what I tested them is I used parallel tasks in both languages and measured their phonological awareness Phonological awareness in English was measured with the uh, phoneme deletion task from CTOP, the Comprehensive Test of Phonological Processing. And then uh, in Chinese, there is no standard standardized test whatsoever for this population, so I have to come up with my own tasks. And following uh, prior research, I did, um, you know, used an onset and rhyme and tone differenti differentiation task, which is basically augment out. Uh, like you hear three sounds, and then you tell me which sound has a different onset phoneme, or a rhyme, or a tone. Uh, and then I used uh, real word naming and pseudo word naming in English. This comes from the subset of Woodcock Johnson Reading Diagnostic Reading Battery, which is a standardized test. For Chinese, uh, it's a curriculum driven list of characters and words. And then I also measured their oral vocabulary knowledge from uh, both the receptive perspective and also expressive. For English, I used the uh, receptive and expressive one-word picture vocabulary uh, test. I believe um, some of you may be very familiar with it. And for, in, uh, for Chinese, I used um, also the same format, but the uh, different set of pictures from this set. There is no standard, standardized test again, so I have to innovate in a way. But uh, it is good enough to get an indicator of their oral vocabulary knowledge and the reliability, which I did not include here, but in the paper, are acceptable. Um, I also use the whisk r as a digit span test, which is basically to have a basic cognitive control of their uh, skills. And then at time two, which is at the end of second grade, I measured them, uh, their passage reading comprehension. The English task comes from the uh, Woodcock Johnson Reading Diagnostic Battery. Um, and I, using the same format, and based on what they have learned in the Chinese curriculum, I designed a similar uh, task in Chinese. And the teacher made sure everything I used in the Chinese tasks are uh, appropriate. So I consulted uh, two to three Chinese teachers in the school. So here's what I found. Um, so you see some of these are missing because in order just to put everything in one graph, um, 
English phonological awareness stu student did really well, and then the Chinese has three subtasks here. And you can see overall, um, the student performed quite well uh, in both languages. And for, for tasks that are multiple choice, they performed well about, above chance level. So next, I will um, scrutinize the data a little more. And uh, this is just the correlation among all variables. They are nicely correlated across the two languages. But let's take a look at the Chinese uh, variables first. Um, so interestingly, you can see that phonological awareness and uh, the vocabulary, oral vocabulary measures are nicely correlated with each other. Um, but tone awareness, children's sensitivity to, to tone differences, actually correlated stronger than other, the other two phonological tasks. And also, even though the oral vocabulary uh, measures also correlated well with the character reading, character and word reading, as well as the passage reading, expressive oral vocabulary measure is more, strong, uh, more strongly correlated with the reading measure than the receptive measure, okay? Um, so here is what it shows. And next, I used a regression analysis to see which variable actually predict, you know, time one uh, character and word reading scores, and then which measure predicts time two reading comprehension scores. And what I found is that for reading uh, in Chinese at time one, phonological awareness block did not actually uh, uh, explain any additional variance if we take into consideration of their oral vocabulary knowledge. Uh, however, tone awareness contributed to character and word reading if it is entered before the oral language measure, but its predictive power was removed if it's entered after. That seemed to suggest that tone awareness contribute to character and word reading indirectly through oral vocabulary measures. And secondly, um, oh, what happened here? Uh, expressive oral vocabulary knowledge actually made a unique contribution after all the other variables have been controlled for um, of t uh, time one character and word reading. So that's. That's the first set of uh, interesting uh, findings. And secondly, um, I used the same set of Chinese variables to predict Chinese reading comprehension at the end of second grade. And what I found is that um, consistent with other findings that character and word knowledge is the most important predictive uh, predictor in reading comprehension, I found this as well. However, for this group of learners, on top of their character and word knowledge, in predicting reading comprehension, expressive oral vocabulary contributed an additional 9% uh, to predict predicting uh, reading comprehension. So I think this is the most interesting finding uh, so far for now. And now let's move on to English. So English measures generally uh, correlated well with each other, and I applied the same set of uh, regression analysis. So similar to other studies, phonological awareness, which is phoneme <coughs> deletion, as I used here, explained a unique variance. I don't know why there are weird symbols turning up. <laughs> um, but then expressive vocab oral vocabulary knowledge did not make any additional or unique contribution to English word and pseudo word naming over and above and beyond phonological awareness, okay? And in predicting time two reading comprehension, this uh, oral vocabulary knowledge was significant if entered before phonological awareness and word naming, but everything was removed if word naming, word knowledge was, pre uh, was put first. That means in predicting reading comprehension in English, word naming is the most significant and unique variable. So later I also conducted another set of uh, pre uh, regression analysis predicting uh, reading comprehension in one language after controlling for variables in that language and additionally used another set of uh, variables from the additional language to see if your skills from uh, the additional language contribute anything additional 
to explaining reading comprehension in the first language, in the, the other language. So what was found is that English phoneme awareness actually contributed 20% uh, uh, contributed to, to explaining 20% of the variances in Chinese character and word naming after all the Chinese factors have been taken, taken uh, into consideration. Um, so what does this all mean? Uh, I think first of all I would like to discuss the different patterns with, of within language relationship. So in English, this is uh, actually what we are all familiar with. Phoneme awareness, your sensitivity to the individual phonemes in English actually is the strongest uh, uh, unique predictor of English word and pseudo word naming or reading. This is not new finding. Um, and phoneme awareness was not a unique predictor of later uh, reading comprehension, which is also um, consistent with what other research suggests because code related skills such as pho phoneme awareness contribute a lot to decoding, but reading comprehension requires a lot beyond that. It requires your semantic knowledge. Um, as therefore, pho phoneme awareness is a necessary but not sufficient condition for reading comprehension. Whereas in Chinese, the situation is slightly different. We found that tone awareness did not contribute directly, but indirectly, right? And then expressive vocabulary knowledge is a unique and significant predictor. Um, this is, to me, it may suggest that it, take, it may take non-native speakers a longer amount of time to refine their sensitivity to tone. And, uh, and this sensitivity is dependent on and emerges from their oral language competence or experience. And this is consistent actually with the old but still good theory, uh, lexical restructuring hypothesis. And according to this hypothesis, words in children's um, mental lexicon develop first holistically. And as they mature, uh, as their language experience accumulates, um, they become more finely grained and segmental. And then, uh, you know, therefore the refinement is largely depend, uh, dependent on vocabulary growth and it is on an item specific basis. Therefore, um, I suspect if we you know, measure an older group of students, we may see that tone awareness may emerge as a more uh, unique and or critical um, skill. So uh, this is also consistent with findings um, among native speakers. Research has consistently shown that seven-year-old children in mainland China have performed better than five-year-old on tone processing skills, uh, I mean tasks. And, and uh, also another study done by uh, in, I told, I, I told in 2011 suggests that tone processing skills contributed to eight to nine-year-old children's sentence reading comprehension. So my subjects are seven-year-old and they are second language learners, so that's why it's not that significant yet. Um, and then cross-linguistic resource sharing. What I found is one directional meaning from English to Chinese, which is consistent with what um, many studies have found in the field uh, on Chinese heritage language learners. Um, and what this suggests is that for sequential bilingual learners, I think their first language phonological skill is the foundation um, for second language learning. And then their L2 proficiency, second language proficiency, is a very important factor in uh, influence the directionality of the um, where, where, from which language to which language, and also in what tasks you're measuring. So for my, this study, I only measured phonological task and word level and uh, reading comprehension, but if we examine other levels of tasks, such as morphology or sentence reading, it might be different. Um, so next, I would like to talk about the importance of expressive oral vocabulary oral vocabulary knowledge. Um, my finding of the significance of this construct is consistent with Chinese and English monolingual readers as well as Spanish ESL learners. Uh, however, in studies that's dealing with or looking at Chinese bilingual readers who are mostly heritage language learners, expressive vocabulary knowledge is not typically measured because it's time consuming. But I argue that 
we cannot ignore this aspect of the vocabulary knowledge. Um, the significance of this vocabulary knowledge <coughs> is that it serves as a key link between word identification and comprehension in the word-to-text integration process. And expressive oral vocabulary knowledge may actually measure uh, the stronger lexical representations than the receptive aspect, okay, activated by spoken words. Um, because it may suggest a stronger semantic connection. Um, and next, I would like to um, suggest a few implications for future research, especially dealing with Chinese and uh, um, English bilingual learners, is to first dis distinguish the receptive and productive or expressive aspects of vocabulary knowledge. And for those who are thinking about doing research with the dual language immersion population, especially those in the one-way uh, classrooms, because they receive little environmental input in the language outside of the classroom, therefore, the quality of the language they receive within the classroom becomes very important in shaping their language development. So I argue that we really need to uh, examine carefully their classroom language input. Additionally, if possible, you know, some, pro uh, some student may have extensive out-of-school experience if we could take that into consideration, especially for those who uh, are in a Spanish program, let's say, okay? And next, for future research, um, we really need to expand to different student groups. My current, this current study has a very limited set of um, participants because of all these realistic constraints of conducting uh, external research in a public school. If you have ever done it, you know how difficult it is. Um, but uh, with that said, um, we need to include students who are not just uh, homogeneous in their background, in their uh, home language. In my case, it's all English, but that doesn't reflect the educational reality in other programs. For example, in the uh, Seattle Public Schools Chinese Immersion Program uh, in Beacon Hill and Dearborn Park, we have students of a variety of home language uh, backgrounds. So we need to take that into consideration. And also, more challengingly, <laughs> there are students also who suffer from uh, learning disabilities or reading difficulties enrolled in a public school program like this. We cannot deny their access to a, a dual language um, education, but then the question is really challenging. How do we uh, actually help them, right? But this is really many levels above of what I can answer at this point. Um, and next, for instruction, I really uh, want to advocate, which seems to be very obvious, this language-specific language and literacy instructional methods. Uh, I say it's obvious because as foreign language professionals, we know this is no-brainer. But for many educators out there, they still believe in this good teaching is good teaching mentality. They still have this mentality, which suggests that you know, a universal approach to lit literacy and language instruction is good enough. And um, because such kind of, um, their belief is based on research done on monolingual English-speaking students, and then they assume such methods, if proven by research, can be readily applied to other types of learners or in a linguistically diverse classroom, which is not true. Um, and uh, clearly, literacy instruction methods and strategies <coughs> need to be adapted not only according to learners' profiles, but also to need to be language-specific, like I demonstrated today. And another, however, sorny issue is that for Chinese language teacher preparation programs, or not Chinese, maybe Japanese, or maybe uh, you know Russian, those less, less commonly taught languages, we, across the nation, we really have only few institutions that can provide language-specific methodology classes to our K-12 foreign language classroom teachers. They are offered a generic teaching methods class and go figure how to teach your own language, that's it. So I argue this is a very obvious issue. It's not easy to solve, but that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't be thinking about a strategy to cope with this issue. Um, and then for instruction, I argue that not only Chinese teachers, but 
maybe all dual language immersion teachers should focus more on productive language use uh, and assessing students more through productive rather than receptive tasks. Uh, because even for French immersion, this is as early as 1985, Meryl Swine pointed out that the French immersion program typically prevent, uh, provides students with a acquisition-rich input. Therefore, immersion students are very comfortable sitting in the classroom listening to their teachers and make a few nods and they're not being pushed to output. Therefore, upon program exit, when you access their proficiency and accuracy, you, you will be surprised, right? So, uh, <laughs> Meryl Swan also argued that little attention was paid to students' target language use. Therefore, from my study, I found that, you know, for Chinese language learners, expressive oral vocabulary knowledge at grade two already significantly and uniquely predict your reading comprehension. So it is important in that not only it signifies your language proficiency, but it is critical in your learning to read process. Um, if I may be more, if I may make a more bold proposal, I would like to call for a more coherent biliteracy instruction framework. Um, currently, dual language programs for majority language learners typically use the one language, one teacher, one classroom um, kind of model, which means that the language students are learning are strictly separated by space, by time, and by the main interlocutor, which is their teacher. Um, teachers address their language and literacy learning in their respective time slots, but could we engage students in more meaningful cross-linguistic analysis and comparison? And could, we, uh, could the instructor in the two languages be made more connected? And could students' emergent bilingual skills be capitalized on more intentionally and more um, um, specifically, okay? And how? This is to be <laughs> explored further. I do not have an answer, but um, for those who work with the traditionally known as the ELL learners, but now we call them immersion bilingual learners, um, in Spanish, there has been work um, going on, but those kind of work has not been translated into uh, foreign language immersion, this field, okay? And then in the end, um, so Bernhardt in 2011 suggests that second language research has little value if, unless it can be applied. So you may ask, what can I offer to the speech and hearing community, right? Uh, but it will be too premature and presumptuous for me to offer any concrete suggestion to this community, but I would like to leave you with some food for thought. Um, some of you probably already know that the Washington State has passed this bill, um, which will provide, which is providing <laughs> um, funding for public schools to expand dual language program offering in early learning as well as K-12. That means in the next few years, uh, we will be seeing more and more bilingual learners, bilingual families, and maybe bilingual patients in your clinics. Um, how do we provide service to those students or learners? Or how do we actually properly assess them? And how do we uh, design and uh, implement intervention addressing their particular needs. I think th those are the food for thought that I would like to leave with you. And thank you. Okay, and any questions from the audience? Um, I was wondering on the, the, the children that you looked at uh, in the second grade, uh, were they introduced first to uh, English literacy in by first grade? And then uh, what was the program? Yes, that's for? a good question. I bypassed that point. Uh, actually, this program is a 50-50 program, and the literacies in both languages are introduced from kindergarten on. Um, yeah, but like I said, I would like to, I wanted to give them more time to develop Chinese literacy before I assess them. Yeah. Oh, yes. So I have a scientific question and then sort of the parent question being from a bilingual household. Okay. So I'll start with the parent question first, right? Okay. Informal learning seems to be a huge deal to get the, the second language going or going. Yes. In, in my case, the first language going. Yeah. Um, if my kid is not asking the question, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to give him food. He mm -hmm. will learn this big man. 
<laughs> right. Um, how do you, I mean, if you're not speaking that language at home, mm. how do you actually get those students practice yeah. in an informal manner, which probably really accelerates the, the language acquisition? Right. So how, how, how can they do that? Right, so I don't think my research can directly answer that question, so I'm speaking from a parent's perspective as well. <laughs> first, uh, uh, first is that really if you don't have that language environment at home, that doesn't mean you can't learn to learn a second language. My parents did not speak, or still do not speak English, yet I learned English. So that, that means really classroom experience is vital. And secondly, uh, I would like to really recommend two books to you. Uh, one is called Bilingual Edge, written by uh, Alison McKee uh, and her colleagues from Georgetown that offers uh, good advice for parents who do not actually speak an additional language. And secondly is another book uh, by Colin Baker, uh, it's also another handbook for parents about bilingual development. Yeah. So the scientific question is about phonological awareness. So yeah. from your, um, the instruction of uh, uh, Chinese yes. immersion, does it predicate that pinyin is actually taught? Yes. Or no, oh. if you remove the pinyin version yeah. and then just have the characters, with, does that actually just have phonological awareness in the translation of the two languages? That's a very good question. Um, so for those who don't know, pinyin, pinyin is uh, basically a, a sound annotating system using uh, Roman letters um, and is taught to children and also uh, adults who are learning Chinese as a foreign language. So for this particular program, at the point of my, my data collection, they have not learned pinyin or taught pinyin yet. Oh. Yes, mm -hmm. so they have not. Uh, however, there, in the literature, there are studies comparing um, children in Beijing who were taught pinyin upon school entry and the children in Hong Kong who also learned to read characters but primarily through the look and say method. And then children from Taiwan who learn bopomofo, which is another type of um, non-alphabetic uh, sound annotating system. And it was found, actually, um, the Beijing children have a higher level of phonological sensitivity compared to Hong Kong children. Oh, Beijing and Taiwanese children have better phonological sensitivity than uh, the Hong Kong children. Yeah. But it doesn't affect the production, though, right? Because, say, without tonal awareness, mm -hmm. I can still produce Cantonese words. Yeah. Right. So the phonological awareness is only one aspect of it. It doesn't actually change the production. Yeah, I think the idea about uh, you know metalinguistic awareness is that it develops as you learn the language, but it's not a prerequisite for you to learn the language. If if that's um, if that answers your question, yeah. So uh, like we all learn to uh, we we all speak English, but some native English speakers actually may not know. Oh yeah, actually words can be segmented this way and all that. And Chinese. Uh, speakers, when you ask them, oh, this, this tone, these two tones are the same or different? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course they're different, but they don't normally think about it. Yeah. So, okay. Yes. Um, I, I'm actually not in the research um, circle. Uh, I do teach mm -hmm. uh, and a parent as well. Uh, I want to get some clarification if, if possible. Um, it was encouraging to see your research. Um, sort of proves that the speaking part helps the learning, mm -hmm. the reading, writing later, mm -hmm. which was the, the thinking that I had as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a school where children are not formally learning to write, mm -hmm. but they have to play in, in Chinese. Yes. It's enforced, which is hard to do, but it's yes. enforced, and their uh, improvement is striking. Yeah. Within three months, you yeah. can see. Um, but I also saw your your um, this this uh, subject that you are studying that at second grade mm -hmm. you said there wasn't much difference among the subjects whether they have speaking language at home or not. Oh, the difference means that they did not perform differently on the tasks that I measured them with. That doesn't mean that they did not have other types of differences. Mm -hmm. So I guess my. Um, I'm trying to understand mm -hmm. 
whether having, for example, mm -hmm. um, at least one parent speaking the language and mm -hmm. having the speaking right. um, environment that's more um, or superior simply because some other families don't have it. Yeah. Does that have a, a you know, um, it's a helpful to their learning of writing and reading? Okay, that's a very good question. So let me rephrase your question. Basically, you're asking whether speaking the language at home help this child learn to read this language, right? Okay, um, the, the answer can be complicated. So let me tell you what I found from another studies I did. Uh, I compared a group of emergent learners with a group of heritage language learners. The heritage language learners speak Chinese, have Chinese speaking parents at home. Well, that doesn't mean that they speak Chinese to the parents at home, right? But they have the language environment. And this group of emergent learners who do not have Chinese speaking parents at home, but they have sustained classroom input from school. I compared them on a variety of measures, including phonological awareness and their reading skills, right? And guess what? The Chinese heritage language learners outperformed the emergent learners on their sensitivity to tones, yeah? However, the <laughs> emergent learners significantly outperformed the heritage language learners when it comes to reading. Because like I said, language, although learning to read, we need spoken language, right? But we also need a substantial amount of input and also time on task. So simply having a parent speaking the language at home does not guarantee you learn how to read. We have so many uh, heritage language speakers on campus who do, not, who do not have the literacy skills. Yeah, uh, sorry, Michelle, oh, and her can I finish? Yeah, yeah. The, the Quran, a Quran mm -hmm. enough question. So I, I actually did see that part um, in your presentation. However, do you differentiate mm. the heritage learner who actually are going through this emergent learning mm. environment? Okay, Was there that's a good question. Uh, in my study, unfortunately, I cannot find a substantial amount of them for me to form a comparison group. So I, for these two of them, I cannot see any difference on the things that, that I measure them with. Okay, but that doesn't mean if we go to Bellevue, let's say in their two-way immersion class, we may find a substantial amount of difference. That's why I'm very cautious about what I suggest. Yeah. Okay, Michelle. Uh, yeah, on that note, I was just going to add that in our programs like Beacon Hill and Mercer, where we do have a number of students that have some Chinese heritage background, often it's Cantonese or mm -hmm. it could be Vietnamese, right. but we're around Chinese-speaking folks. Mm -hmm. What we see on, on proficiency assessments like STAMP that are looking for general ability to read, that they generally quite outperform the other children in immersion because they haven't had a broader exposure to the to characters and a, a variety of characters. They tend to get what they need to get the academic content they're learning. And so just because you're in a home, even if you're not, even if it's not Mandarin speaking, but you're seeing characters, you're seeing, you're, you have a meaning, you have just an awareness of characters mm -hmm. as a way of communicating information that a non-Chinese person might not have. Now that can shift over time, but. Right, and another thing I would like to point out is that um, another area, and also from my book that I did not discuss here today, is the academic literacy. Um, one thing is this, you know, general language proficiency, right? Another thing is academic language proficiency and academic literacy, which really require classroom time, actual teaching, and actual learning. So that's why uh, we see so many heritage language learners going through programs for so many years still do not have the required academic literacy skills. They, they have the general oral language proficiency skills. Yeah, but I think those, are, those kind of questions really have um, very important in educational impacts, need to be more carefully followed up in the future. Yeah, I see you over there, yeah. Um, I have a question from the parents. So one of the um, parents of his friends has a child that's just entering middle school and is uh, the joining of McDonald and John Stanford. And apparently, um, the, they're in Japanese, and the Japanese learning at John Stanford is more oriented to learning the characters, so the kids going into middle school there know more of the kanji characters than the kids coming from McDonald who seem to be learning more of the conversational language skills. And I'm just wondering what your thinking is on, um, is, is one strategy 
more efficient for language learning and bioliteracy than the other? Uh, we're talking about Japanese literacy rather than biliteracy here because the Japanese program addresses the Japanese literacy. Um, I think if we are uh, aiming for, I, I mean, this is not based on my research, but based on my personal understanding of the matter, is that if we're really aiming for a comprehensive you know, language pr proficiency, we need to address all aspects of the matter. Um, <laughs> Kanji knowledge is important. Conversational skills is important. We cannot ignore one aspect or another. Yeah. So that's why at, at the UW in our language classes, we adopt an integrated approach. <laughs> yeah. But Michelle may have more to add. No, I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah. And I think one of the challenges that we have in our public school systems when we're trying to do dual language immersion is that our our uh, certification process requires that teachers have like the elementary education endorsement, but that doesn't mean that they ever learned how to teach Chinese, Japanese, or Spanish, even if they're native speakers. And so um, that's the place that you can't get away from needing to have that yeah. knowledge as well. Right. And I would like to also share um, uh, with you about what I found from this group of parents that I worked with. So actually, informally, I conducted a survey um, among them, and uh, I asked them, so what's your expectation for your children when they graduate from this Mandarin program, right, five years down the line? And some of them wrote, well, I expect them just to be like a native Chinese children of this age. <laughs> and some others wrote that I want them to be able to write Chinese or read Chinese poems. Um, and others are more realistic, like, oh, I, I hope that they will be able to order in a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> so, with that said, with that said, I think it is really important for those uh, parents, especially who have a child in a dual language immersion program, K to five, to have a realistic goal of what your children can achieve within five years. Um, it is not really a balanced bilingual or biliteracy person you're going to have at the end of five, uh, uh, grade five. But more importantly, I always talk to parents, I, say, I tell them, as long as your, ch your child loves learning that language, you know, that's perhaps good enough and they will continue learning. You know, they will become a lifelong learner. But if within that five years in, in, kin uh, in uh, elementary school, you actually extinguish their love for language, their desire for learning, Regardless of how good that program is, I don't think it's worth it. So, but of course, we have state standards. We have, you know, uh, benchmarks at this point for all these uh, uh, reading and writing and uh, uh, listening and speaking. You know, all these benchmarks. So for now, as long as we reach those ben those benchmarks, I think we're we should celebrate it. <laughs> yeah. So that's my that's my understanding of of uh, the situation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.